Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Professor Jerry McCoy, and I teach physics at the University of Tulsa. And I am really glad to be with you all here this morning. These are strange times, I'm sure you know, but for me, it's giving me a chance to do some science with you all. So what does a physics professor like me do? I teach students who are about 18 or 19 years old, probably a little older than many of you. I teach them about physical science, the science of our physical world, everything from magnets to light to forces to black holes and all sorts of interesting things. I love it. I have loved physics ever since I was a child. My dad was a physics professor, and I just have been hooked on science and particularly physics since I was a kid. So today, I'm hoping to share some of that with you all. Now, uh, I will tell you right here at the beginning that if you enjoy what you see today, you can do this too. There came a time when I saw, was looking at physics and I was thinking, wow, that is really cool. And you can grow up to do this stuff yourself. Doesn't have to be physics, could be biology, could be electrical engineering, but this could be you. So any case, let's go ahead and get started. So I wanna start by telling you what the difference is between a scientist, which is what I teach, and an engineer. A scientist is someone who studies the world around us to try to understand how it works. And once we understand that, then engineers take that understanding and build useful things like airplanes and cell phones and refrigerators, things that you use every day. So a scientist works hard at understanding how nature behaves. An engineer takes that knowledge and, and solves real problems. How do I keep my food cold? How do I get and make it hot? And how do I talk to somebody who's on the other side of the world? So today, I want to talk to you about, uh, about something. And I'm just going to introduce it by saying, you know, every day, if you'll just stop and pay attention, you'll see amazing things that are going on in the world around us. I just want to take some simple examples. So for instance, you can probably see this picture. Let me, uh, I'm gonna pull it down and bring it up where you can see it. This is a picture of a snowflake. Now, nature produces these in the billions anytime it snows. But look at that gorgeous picture. Look at that amazing uh, structure and order and beauty. And nature makes billions of them, and I've heard it said many times that no two of these are alike. Well, it's easy to not pay attention to snow. I mean, it's fun when you get your school day canceled because of snow, but, you know, it's just one of the things in our lives. But it's really magical. Here's another thing. Now, here are the keys to my, um, my car, my home, and all that. And, um, you know, there's nothing special about them, but I have here a very strong magnet, although I can't tell it's strong. I mean, I can stick it up next to me and I'm not feeling anything unusual, but watch this. If I bring it up close to my keys, watch what happens. It attracts them. It picks them up and that's, you know, maybe you've played with magnets before and been fascinated by them. But that's really astonishing that it has no effect on me, but it can pick my keys up. Well, there are all sorts of things that are just in nature that are just magical. Lightning. Next time you see a thunderstorm that there's lightning, watch the lightning. It's just absolutely fantastic. Well, one of the things that I want to talk with you about is something called phase changes. Now, a phase change uh, is when a material, a substance, changes its property. So for instance, you all know what phase changes are like. For instance, if you have a glass of water, you know that that water is 
Um, it's cool. It t- it's oftentimes cool, but it's slippery and it fills the glass and it's wet and all of the water is the same. It's not like various parts of the water are different. Everything in that water is pretty much the same. However, if you stick that glass of water into a refrigerator, into a freezer uh, overnight and come back the next morning, it will be completely different. No longer is it wet and um, slippery. It's now very cold and very hard. It's gone through what's called a phase change. Originally, the phase that it was in was liquid water, was liquid. But by taking heat out of it, and that's what a freezer does, it freezes things. By taking heat out of it, uh, it made that water go through a phase change to become another phase, which is solid. So it went from liquid water to solid ice. And now the two are completely different from each other. If somebody didn't know any better, if somebody did not know that water and ice were made of the same basic molecules, they'd look at them and think that they were two completely different things. Okay, so I want to talk to you about uh, phase changes today. Now, the way typically you make a phase change happen, say with water or um, you know something else, is you either add heat to it or you take heat away. So I'm going to bring up another picture here. And what I'm going to show you is this in this picture, if you start off with with ice, just pull an ice cube out of your freezer and just let it sit there. What it will do is absorb heat from the environment and that'll make it go through a phase change. There will come a particular temperature right at zero degrees Celsius, which is the same thing as 32 degrees Fahrenheit, just two different temperature scales. If you take the heat out, I mean, if you start putting heat into that ice cube and get it right to zero degrees Celsius, it will begin melting. It will go through a phase change and end up as water. Now, if you continue to add heat to it, then after a bit, you'll get the temperature of that water up to about 212 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 100 degree, is 100 degrees Celsius, and that will cause it to change from the liquid water to the gas that we call water vapor, or oftentimes we refer to it as steam. That happens at 212 um, um, degrees Fahrenheit, or about 100 degrees Celsius. And of course, you can go the other way. I can take heat out of steam and turn it into liquid, and I can take heat out of liquid, which is what I do when I put it in a refrigerator, and turn it into a solid. So you can just go back and forth between these. Matter of fact, there's even another phase that uh, you may not know. It's not even on this chart. It's called plasma. You know, I told you that um, um, if you heated water up to 212 degrees, well, if you heat it up to about 21,000 degrees, which is not something we can do here on Earth, then it will cause that water to change into another phase called a plasma. But that's a little more than I want to talk about this morning. So um, those are just some simple phase changes that uh, I wanted to talk to you about. But I also want to talk to you about another phase change that is one of these things that is just magical. And that is superconductivity. Now, superconductivity is when a material, when a material becomes a superconductor, it loses all of its electrical resistance. So what's electrical resistance, you might wonder? Well, let's let's first think about it this way. Let's imagine that you're out to, to uh, you're out at a, at a, uh, um, uh, a restaurant and your waitress or waiter brings you a glass and there's a straw in it. 
Well, you know what to do with that. You put your mouth on one end and, and start pulling with your mouth. You suck on the end of the straw and the liquid, soda pop or water, whatever, comes up the straw. And it's easy. Everybody learns how to sip through a straw when they're uh, young. But now imagine packing that that straw with sand in a way that it couldn't get out. So so that when I suck on it this next time, it's not going to come out in my mouth. So just imagine packing that straw with sand. OK, now were I to use it and stick that down in my soda pop and start pulling, I would find it a lot harder to get the liquid from my glass up into my mouth. Well, electrical resistance is a little bit like that. Um, think of all the wires, the electrical wires that are in the walls of your house. Maybe you don't get to see them very often, but they're there. And there's wires in all the electrical um, uh, appliances in your house. There's a power cord on the back of your refrigerator. There's a power cord on the back of your TV. Those things have to be plugged in. That's like the soda straw. And what we do is by plugging them in, we're able to move charge along those power cords so that they can make our refrigerators and our washing machines and our televisions and our computers run the way they're supposed to. Now, with those electrical cords, in the material, it, it, they're kind of like a soda straw. And the, and, and the charges that try to move down those power cords uh, have a difficult time, kind of like the water trying to make its way through the sand in your straw. Every material that we use to build wires has electrical resistance. It's kind of like the sand in the soda straw, and it's tough to get the charges to go from uh, from the power company and into your TV. I mean, it, there's there's resistance. They don't get a free ride. And as a matter of fact, um, it's uh, as, as you as those charges move along the on along the various wires that extra effort they have to go to to fight through the electrical resistance you is always shows up as wasted energy in the form of heat now you all know what that's like if you've ever worked with um the uh your uh, computer sitting on your lap if you have a laptop computer and you have it sitting on, on your lap you know that where the batteries are get hot that's just wasted energy wasted in the electrical resistance of the computer. You know that light bulbs can be warm to touch. If you stopped, well, for instance, if you stopped sucking on the straw, the water would quit moving through the straw. In the same way, if you quit pushing on the charges, they would quit uh, moving through the, through the electrical wires. So wouldn't it be really cool if we could find a, a material that has no electrical resistance, but that's that's a little bit like saying, can we ever rub our hands together and not have friction between our hands? You know that you can reduce friction. You know, you can get your hands wet or you can even put soap or oil on your hands and they'll get to be less friction, but you'll never eliminate it completely. In the same way, with ordinary materials, you just can't get rid of electrical resistance. So we're always going to be wasting some amount of energy when we transfer energy from one place to another. And this is, a, you know, this is a time that we don't need to be wasting energy. We need to save all the energy that we possibly can. So I wanna tell you a story about a scientist who does the kind of things that I do. About 109 years ago, a, um, a Dutch scientist named 
Heike Camberling owns was doing an experiment. And this is what scientists do. And this is what physicists do. He was doing an experiment to measure the effect that, um, that temperature has on electrical resistance. And so I'm, I'm hoping that in your school, you've learned how to graph numbers. So this is what he was doing. He was creating a graph that looked like this. And by the way, here's a picture of Heike Camberling owns. I've got my finger in the way, so I'll pull that out. But let me, let me see if I can show you him up close. This is, um, this is Dr. Owens, and this was in 1911, 109 years ago. It was in April, so only like uh, it was, uh, it would have been last month. And he was doing this experiment where on this axis, he was measuring temperature. And on this axis, he was measuring electrical resistance. Now, scientists knew that, so, so on this, if, if I come to the left on this axis, that's going towards lower temperature. And if I go to the right, this is hot, this is cold. As a matter of fact, zero is the co coldest you can get. This would be a temperature scale that maybe you haven't heard about before. It's called Kelvins. At zero Kelvins, that's as cold as you can get. On the electrical resistance, there would be zero, and then uh, who knows how high resistance could go. But he, everybody knew up till that point that if you measured the resistance, the electrical resistance, and how it depended on temperature, here's what they found. If you were out here where it was hot, then the resistance would be up here where it's high. So high temperature gave high resistance. But as you start cooling the material that you're trying, whether it's copper or, or aluminum, this would be the material that you push the, uh, the charges through. If you start measuring, you'll, you'll see that the colder you make the material, the less the resistance. And so everybody knew this, and you can connect this up with a line, that for most materials, the colder it got, the lower the temperature. But see, here's the thing with Dr. Owens. He had the very best way to cool something down, colder than anybody in world history had ever done it before. And this was in 1911. He was able to get all the way down to about here, which was four Kelvins. And uh, uh, that's extremely cold. It's four Kelvins is like 450 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. So it's amazingly cold. He had brand new equipment that could cool the material. And he was working with the, the material mercury. And it was pretty, it's pretty common material. You don't want to handle mercury. It's because uh, that can get a person quite sick. But he found something astonishing happen. He kept cooling it down and it got to a certain temperature and the temperature was 4.15 kelvins, and all of a sudden, the electrical resistance dropped to zero. Here is a graph, you can see it right here. This graph, I'm gonna see if I can bring this up closer so you can tell what's going on. Here is a graph of what he found. Nobody had ever seen this or expected the, the resistance to go to zero. Well, don't you see the importance of that? That means that if we could figure out how to get materials to do that, then we could send electricity over wires and, uh, and without electrical resistance, without losing energy. 
and it would have amazing impact on the way we live our lives. So he even, that was such an important discovery that he even got the Nobel Prize for it. So what I want to show you is something that goes along with superconduct um, with superconductivity. Here, it's not just ordinary materials that exhibit it. This is a material called yttrium barium copper oxide. I'll hold it up close. It's if you were holding it, it just looks like a black disc. And this material uh, has no magnetic properties whatsoever. See, if I um, if I take this material and hold a magnet up to it, like I was picking up my keys, it doesn't pick it up, doesn't have any effect on it. This is a little tiny magnet. It, it may be hard for you to see, but there's a little magnet right there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you something. When a material becomes a superconductor, it also demonstrates amazing, magical magnetic effects. So here, I'm going to show it to you now. Um, I'm going to tip this down so that you can see um, what you can see is this. Um, um, little arrangement that I have, and I'm going to get it right up close where you can see exactly what's going on. Okay, so here I have, uh, let me get it just right, there it is, right there. So here I have that little magnet sitting on top of that superconductor, and what I'm going to do is cool that superconductor down with this, what I have in my hand, which is a doer of liquid nitrogen. Now, nitrogen is all around us. Every breath you take is uh, almost 80% nitrogen. If you cool it enough, it goes through a phase change from the gas that you breathe to a liquid. So what I'm going to do is pour it where this superconductor is, and what it's going to do is it's going to start, what it's going to do is start cooling that superconductor down. It's not a superconductor yet, but in just a moment, it will be, it will go through a phase change and it will become a superconductor. And then you're going to see something amazing happen to that little magnet. Remember right now, there's no magnetic properties, but it's going to go through its phase change to superconductivity, where not only will it have no electrical resistance, but it will also um, it will also show you an amazing magnetic effect, and we call it the Meissner effect. Okay, keep it. Oh, here it goes, right there. There. Can you see what just happened to this little magnet? It's now levitated. It's now up in the air. And look. Can you see what I'm doing? I'm just giving it a little spin. I sure hope you can see that. I don't know whether you can or not, but I can see it right here. And it's now up in the air. And so not only is this superconductor levitating that magnet, that's called the Meissner effect, but it's also a perfect conductor. Now I wanna tell you that if we can come to the place where we can get materials to superconduct at temperatures where you don't have to cool them off so much. Matter of fact, if we could do it at room temperature or normal temperature, the amount of applications that engineers could come up with would be mind boggling. In particular, we would be able to build, um, we would be able to, yeah, I, I can tell from my picture that you can see that. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? It's just magical. And what will happen is as soon as the superconductor warms back up again, that magnet will just quietly settle back down. And this, this material, the yttrium barium copper oxide, will no longer be a superconductor. It'll just be a regular old piece of material with nothing special about it. Electrical resistance, no magnetic properties. If engineers... If engineers could um, create, if engineers 
can create materials or find materials that will superconduct at high temperatures. We could make computers that run faster. Uh, we could make um, uh, magnetic, magnetically levitated trains, trains that don't have to have wheels on the tracks. They can just float over the surface. Think of all the energy we would save if we could do that. We could create uh, better magnetic systems, like the things that are currently used in, in uh, hospital equipment, like um, MRIs. Some of you may have gotten an MRI yourself. You know that big white donut that they slide you into and it buzzes and hums. And then the doctor gets a really nice picture of what's going on inside your body. Uh, but it doesn't have any um, bad effect on you, not like x-rays do. X-rays can, can harm you, but this can't really harm you. I mean, that's why I can hold this magnet up to my face because it's, um, um, it's, you know, it's safe for us. So there's all sorts of applications. So let me end with this. I think that that is magical. There's, there's things that just seem magical all around us, but they're not magical. They're just the way our wonderful world works. A scientist studies that behavior, and an engineer takes that knowledge and builds really interesting stuff. Maybe you want to be a scientist who can figure out materials that will superconduct at high temperatures. Maybe you want to be an engineer who will take that, those kinds of materials, and build them into magnetically levitated trains. Well, I can assure you that right now, our state of Oklahoma, our United States, and our whole world needs good scientists and engineers. And I want to encourage you to think seriously about doing this like I do when you get older. If you like that idea, then what you do is right now. Did I hear that's it? Okay. Then uh, what you do is right now, you study hard in school. Study your math, your reading, your science, and don't let anybody tell you that it's not cool to be smart. God bless you all. It's great talking to you. Professor Jerry McCoy from the University of Tulsa Physics Department. We'll see you later.